All right, Joel Gostin here from joelgostin.com. Uh, I'm really excited about this interview to come because uh, my guest and I have a band in common, um, although we were uh, in, in the band at different times. So it's kind of nice to connect with somebody who has kind of a shared history in, in somewhat uh, in a somewhat fashion, I guess. Um, but coming to me from Los Angeles, California, Mr. Scott Wilkins. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. And yourself? Not too bad. It's it's a Friday night and I'm yeah. fucking done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm spent too. I'm spent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, the, the older you get, the longer the 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 struggle to Friday, you know, gets, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Boy, I remember the days when we used to start on Thursday and go, go, go. We wouldn't even know what Friday was or barely Sunday. Now, yeah, you're right. It's Friday and I'm ready to uh, relax and do whatever it is I'm going to do. Right on, right on. Well, you've got a hell of a history, man, uh, in music. Uh, you've you've been a singer in, in quite a few uh, fantastic bands, including Electric Frankenstein, which was the, the mutual band I referenced earlier. Um, so why don't we really start all the way at the very beginning, man? Um, are you originally from L.A.? Yeah, I, I'm originally born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I split from L.A. right before the Olympics um, to uh, San Francisco, although I've been back and forth from San Francisco to L.A. a bunch. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, in Los Angeles at that time when the um, the Olympics were coming, uh, they wanted to clean up Hollywood. And what I mean by clean up, I don't mean by with a broom and some brushes. <clears throat> I mean, the hammer was coming down. So I just, I was over it, had to go. Yeah. And then journeyed to San Francisco. Well, before you made the jump to, to San Francisco, you had a history musically in L.A., uh, leading up to that time, uh, uh, was was really condemned to death. The first band that you were a part of that you know was recording and doing shows and was kind of active in the scene during that time. Yeah, I had a uh, I had a little band down here in L.A. before San Francisco called the Loners, and I think we did uh, two or three shows. I had a uh, we called them. Uh, there were two midgets. And then a dude playing bass, uh, John Lewis, who's about 6'4", and me. So I, we had two midgets, uh, the the Fox brothers. We were called the Loners. I think we did two shows. I couldn't tell you name one song, except I know that we covered uh, Hurry Up Harry from Sham. Mm. But um, but yes, Kingdom to Death was the... Uh, was the and then I split to San Francisco and ended up in Condemned to Death. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Condemned to Death would have been early to mid eighties in LA. Yeah. So yeah. you you were really no, San Francisco. Condemned Condemned to Death was San Francisco as well. Yeah, yeah, they were oh. part of the Vats at that point. One of those Vat bands. <laughs> oh right. Okay. Okay. Well. You know, San Francisco, you know, I, I talked to a lot of people who came up in the L.A. scene from the 70s. You know, I've had Jack on and, and Paul Rossler and people like that. Mm -hmm. um, but San Francisco had its own very unique history as well. You know, going back to the days of like um, the sleepers and twirling midgets and the mutants and all that. So early 80s, San Francisco. Um, how would you best describe the vibe there as far as, you know, the bands that were really making things happen, uh, the important clubs and, you know, kind of the kind of feel of that early 80s underground scene in San Francisco? Um, well, we were young, so that helped. Uh, and in, in my opinion, um, uh, it was much more because. I came from LA, which was gigantic, you know, um, you know, GBH playing the Olympic to 5,000 people. And, and that's a huge, I didn't even know there was that many punk rockers. Um, but San Francisco was much smaller. Um, I went straight from LA and 
to the vats and squatted the vats in there for a while till I could get a roof. And it was much more united, <clears throat> the scene, and more like a, a family sort of thing. Um, because we were all so young, everybody kind of had to cling to each other in a sense. Do you know what do you know what I mean? Because everybody came from fucked up families and stuff like that. So that's kind of how all that gelled together, in, in in my opinion. That's how I and I felt right at home right away too. Excellent. How how would you compare the police presence in San Francisco to what was going on in LA at the time? Uh, was there that oh. sort of similar backlash in, in San Francisco from the cops to what you guys were doing? No, not no, 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 no. Los Angeles was, I mean, it was out of control. I, you had a chief of police that literally declared war on not only what was going on in South Central, but on the punk rockers too. And I think it's well noted as well. Um, chief Gates, that is. And he really had it out. And I mean, it was it was open season, full Elmer Fudd, shoot how you want, do whatever, ask questions later. Now, San Francisco, much, much, much more lenient. Um, and San Francisco didn't start getting bad until they they wanted to clean up Broadway in a sense. So Broadway was still real seedy in the early 80s and stuff. And there was <laughs> and and. But there was a point in time, I want to say like mid 80s, they kind of had enough and they called it a green light district. The police, that is. I remember the first time encountering, having an encounter with the San Francisco police, this band Channel 3 was up there playing. And my buddy, uh, Matt Young, who was he used to be in uh, Flower Leopards, he was up there playing drums for him. Um, they hadn't played yet. And he jaywalked across Broadway and they took him in. And he was underage. Mm. So that was my first like, whoa, OK, you know, this could get. But, you know, for the most part, they're way, way more night and day compared night and day. Now, how long was Condemned to Death's run as a band? They they were running uh they were running pretty good before I had joined. Um they hadn't released an LP yet. They just they had just done an EP. Uh um God, I can't remember. Something at the beach. Cause I remember coming down to LA shooting a video for Flipside uh with them. And I wasn't in the band then. I'm all over the video. I wasn't in the band then. Eddie was singing with them still. And uh and then we came back to the city and I think just as they were recording the album, um, there was disagreements on mu direction musically and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and Eddie, Eddie split. And I just so happened to be living underneath the table of, uh, the drummer, Mike Chubka's, uh, studio apartment. Cause I didn't have anywhere to live. And um, and we were drinking a bunch of beer and we had one of those little plastic turntables and we were hammered and we, we were playing Beach Boy songs. And I don't know why, but, you know, that's for. But anyway, so we were playing it and I was singing along to it. And Mike just like out of the blue turns to me. He's like, you know what? We need a singer and you should come and go into the studio and sing with us. You sound great. And that's that's how it happened. Cool. And so on that first album, I only did a couple of songs and some backups because like I said, Eddie had left. So they were kind of in a panic and they were paying already for the studio. So I think Keith, the bass player at the time would, would do vocals. I think Mike even did vocals and Tim, the guitar player everybody like traded off vocals. And then when I came in, they were just kind of relieved, like, Oh God, let him do it, man. Let him do the rest of them. So yeah, that was my, that's where I, uh, first, that was my, one of my first recordings. Cool. Now what led to the transition from that band to 
verbal abuse, which is, you know, a pretty big jump forward. Yeah. Uh, anyone's trajectory. I had, uh, we've done a bunch of stuff with Kadim to Dev. Like I said, the LP, et cetera. We did a whole heaps of shows. Um, and like I told you, it was pretty, t it's pretty tight knit up there. Um, verbal abuse had just come back from, uh, their tour. I think it was 84 towards mi middle to end of 84 tour. And, uh, the singer had quit. So <clears throat> we were at our favorite watering hole, which was, uh, Los Portales and, uh, Joey, the guitar player and Dave was there and we just got to talking and, and they just asked me if I wanted to come down. And I was still in Kenim to death. And, you know, after a few margaritas getting you, you're like, yeah, absolutely, man. We'll go down there. Let's do it right now. Um, and, and I went in and sang some tunes with them. And the next thing you know, I was in verbal abuse. It just happened just like that. I don't even think I told the guys from Kenim to death. I think I just was in verbal abuse. <laughs> <laughs> Now, it, it, Rocks Your Liver was the first record you did with Verbal Abuse, right? That was yeah. the first album. And kind of an interesting time for the band. Obviously, you know, the lineup had changed. But the sound of the band was evolving, too. And, and I think that album really falls into that era that a lot of people refer to these days as crossover. You know, mm -hmm. that's when the punk was getting more metal. The metal guys were really getting into punk. You know, so you had this sort of melding going on. Um, and I've always been a fan of, of crossover. I mean, you know, my introduction to a lot of bands was like that era of verbal abuse and then suicidal join the army, you know, agnostic front cause for alarm where it was kind of metal. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, initially when 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 you joined the band and verbal abuse was kind of going in that direction what was the general response like from you know the fans and the people who followed the band initially you know was the change kind of welcomed or was there a little bit of a you know a black flag my war side two situation going on no i i i um from what i remember uh <clears throat> it was um pretty much it was like nothing really had happened. You know what I mean? It was like verbal abuse is playing. Let's go. And <clears throat> yeah, that we had, they had all these new songs. I think that was part of the reason why. So when Rock Your Liver was done, it was still the same band. It, Joey on guitar, Greg on drums. And and then Dave Chavez had, uh, had played bass by then. Um, just wasn't on the first album, but he had been in verbal abuse already. And uh and I think what, uh, and like I said, because it was close knit, that means the metal kids were close knit too. So there was an East Bay faction that was going on, Ruthie's in and so on and so forth. And the metal kids were hanging out with the punk kids, which is completely different than it was in LA because LA, it, it's, it's fisticuffs right away. No questions asked. But in San Francisco, it was different because we, we kind of felt like one of the same. You know what I mean? Although we may have looked different, we felt like one of the same mm. and therefore sharing a beer with my friend with a cut off Levi jacket with a bunch of uh, metal um, patches on it felt just normal to me. So I think it got received pretty good. It actually expanded us much better as well too. Um, that whole crossover thing. I, I enjoyed it. I loved it. Um, yeah. A lot of great records came out during that time for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, gangrene. I mean, there's I mean, we could go on and on and on. COC. Uh, there was there was a lot of and 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 yeah, agnostic front. Uh, <laughs> there was there was a it got received really well. Mm. I didn't get we didn't get any uh, black flag ish backlash from it at all. At all. Like I said, it made it made it much more fun and bigger. And it seemed like the doors were more wide open than they were before. They were bigger doors, shall we say. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, how well it all gelled um, was showcased many years later, probably a solid decade or more, when Slayer put out their punk album. And who do they cover? Verbal abuse, you know, which totally makes sense that those guys would 
pay homage to that era, you know, because it yeah, was well, remember <clears throat> in the 84 tour that Burl Beach was doing at the time, they had met up, met up with Slayer in the Pacific Northwest and into Canada when Slayer had a Camaro and a U-Haul and verbal abuse. So they had loaned each other equipment and stuff too. So that's how it's mostly like, that's a Jeff Hanneman thing than anything else. <clears throat> At least that's what he told me. And, uh, and yeah. And then when Slayer did that now, I didn't, I wasn't on the first album. I initiated everything for Slayer management to get a hold of like Joey because Joey was the only one I had a phone number for. So I had him get a hold of Joey and uh, and kind of like say, Joey, here, Slayer's been trying to get a hold of you forever. They're contacting me here. You take it. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, they got paid pretty handsomely. Good. Yeah. It's, you know, Slayer did him, did him proper. Great. Yeah, you always kind of hope when something like something like that happens that the original songwriters get a few meals out of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, get, they got more than a few meals. <laughs> That's for sure. Excellent. Excellent. So going back to the initial era, um, the Rock Your Liver era, um, we should mention that Jason Shapiro was part of the picture as well at that time, who I just said mm -hmm. recently, he's now a Red Cross and was in Celebrity Skin and, you know, mm -hmm. some other cool stuff when he was out in Boston initially. Um so I got to ask you about Jason, you know, very interesting guy, obviously, um, has a cool history. Um, how do you think he most impacted verbal abuse during his time in the band? Um, it was actually good timing. Um, <clears throat> we, we needed that second guitar player and his flamboyancy as well, because uh, <clears throat> it did kind of give us that kick. And his style of playing that came into ours, it it fit really well. Um, Josh from DRI, Josh is my old best friend. He's dead now, but he was my best friend for many years. And he's the one who turned us on to Jason and said, you got to have this guy play in your band. And that's when we were recording uh, Rock Your Liver. Mm. I don't think Jason was there for the entire recording. And I could be wrong. Um, he did write Metal Melissa the Pissa which was about Spike from DRI's wife, <clears throat> um, the whole entire story. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and he may have played on a few others on that as well. Tom Finn, Flynn played guitar on it. Uh, Bill Collins wrote a song, Can't Stop Us Now, and played guitar on some of it. Um, it was like a big party, more or less. Sylvia Massey produced mm -hmm. it. Or engineered it, I should say. <clears throat> I think it was one of her first gigs. And we drove her insane. We were out of control. I think I was a bike messenger at the time. And I would get in off of work. And I'd have my front basket just filled with beer. Woo! Show up at CD Presents. Get in there, record. Everybody's getting good and hammered. They'd already been laying guitar tracks. And then, of course, I get there and spoil everybody and it was it was a lot of fun recording that album and with jason especially and i lived with him for a bit too he was our roommate as well well <clears throat> yeah he's he's definitely got on to do great stuff you know i'm psyched that he's part of red cross one of my favorite yeah. bands for years you know i mean <clears throat> and the celebrity skin thing was just such his calling um because you know celebrity skin was up in san francisco at the time and we had become good buddies with them. And in fact, I did a show called the Alabama Slamma and put them on the bill. So they're on a bill with verbal abuse, DRI, MDC, Fang, uh, Celebrity Skin, and a band from New York that was hanging out at the time, Token Entry. We put them on there, too, because those were our buddies as well. So we threw all those bands on one bill. Wow. And it was my gig. So I had conned the guy that was running for mayor to say, hey, if we do this show, we can get you a lot of votes. Da, da, da. And he got us this hall. Huh. I mean, <laughs> we hustled that dude. So, oh, it was gnarly. It was, it's funny to listen, to hear back on it. Yeah. So we, we, we conned that dude into it. And then, uh, yeah. And just 
we hung out. I hung out a lot with Celebrity Skin back then as well, too. And it was perfect for Jason. They ended up getting Mike um, from Canem to Death play drums um, before Don Bowles as well. Yeah, and, great band. Great band. Yeah. So we were all like, you know, already all friends. And so it worked out great for everybody. Excellent. And they're really good people. Some of the nicest people I ever met. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh you know it, it's cool to see where people end up, you know, as the years go yeah. on. Sylvia Massey has done some fairly popular records over the years. Yeah. You, know, you, and, you know, she has a lot of meals coming out of that. So <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure. I don't know, Tom. I think I think her and Tom Flynn knew each other, and uh that's how that kind of hooked up, where she may have known um Fuck, I can't think of the guy's name that owns CD Presents. I want to say Stuart, but that isn't right. But anyways, so uh, it may have been a Paul Rat thing, too. I don't know. But uh, I think they had known each other. So I th I'm pretty sure that was like her first her first gig. I could be wrong. She can correct me. But uh, I, I think it was. We drove her batty. She was a, she was a champ, though. She finished it. <clears throat> she was the champ. <clears throat> excellent and uh, your your time in verbal abuse um spanned what 10 years you ended up being in verbal abuse for about a decade mm -hmm. yeah. yeah which is yeah. which is kind of like Three 50 albums. years that's like 50 <laughs> years in punk years you know oh, it's kind of amazing especially after, especially after the tours back then mm. you know <clears throat> Ain't how people are doing tours now. There was none of all these festivals and all this other shit where all these bands get paid all this money. You know what I mean? Everybody got in a van, had that that uh that uh credit card number to call all over, you know what I mean? The stolen credit card numbers to call everywhere to make sure your gig is still happening in Pittsburgh or wherever the fuck. Um yeah. Which, you know, again, 10 years is a long stretch for, for yeah. any band. Um, you were part of the band still in the early 90s when things were kind of starting to change as far as what we what we'd call alternative or underground bands. You know, there started, some bands were starting to see some success, you know. Um, did that sort of changing tide impact verbal abuse at all in that time? Did you see things getting a little easier at that time? Or was it still kind of a rough and tumble punk rock existence for a band? Well, we, we, <clears throat> we were, let's just, I'm just gonna be straight on. We're fuck ups. You know, this, that band was, we were all a bunch of, we were punk rockers. We we're fuck ups. We we're punk rockers playing music. And we had, Kat Serdowski managing us uh, at the time. She was doing Death Angel in this other band, Vang. We ended up cutting ties with her. We ended up with uh, um, another Bill Graham management, uh, Tony Isabella, who had the Hangman and Exodus at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and she got us super close to signing a deal with Metal Blade because Metal Blade was signing everybody at that time. They just got DRI. And we were going to do a deal with them and we had this, I remember this big old meeting and we wanted to be able to renegotiate, con renegotiate the contract is what the lawyer asked if Capital Records, because Metal Blade was a subsidiary, if Capital Records were to pick up the record. And that's where we lost the deal. Mm. They said no. And she said then, she turned to us and said, I wouldn't sign it then. She goes, Capital's got enormous amounts of money and they should be able to pay you guys uh respectfully so there was that and and yeah you know what it, it, even in san francisco it was changing it was a lot of weird trippy acts that shoegazer shit and you know smashing pumpkin shit and and it was in some and it was a lot of funk going on at the time too like metal funk yep you know what i mean which which is a trip in and of itself. <clears throat> and we just all kind of faded away. You know what I mean? Didn't really break up or anything, just kind of faded away because it was kind of boring at the time. Mm. And then that's when 
Yeah. So it was time for me to boogie. Well, you boogied to New York, which yeah. <laughs> brings us to Electric Frankenstein. Um, what uh, Chicken or the egg? What came first, the move to New York or the invite to join EF? The move. Yeah. Yeah, the move. So I moved out there. I didn't have no, I had a bag of clothes. That was it. Moved out there, um, followed some skirt out there and was just bouncing around. Uh, <clears throat> didn't really, really know anybody, but then I ran into like Todd youth and, uh, and Jimmy Gestapo and them. And then of course, Vinny, um, from the times we had played with verbal abuse and agnostic front and so on and so forth. We did Europe with them as well. And, uh, and four way from mm. bad posture. And, uh, the four way ended up giving me a, a gig at his, he had a re uh, rehearsal studio and he got tired of going there. So he said, just leave a 20 under the thing, take the rest of the money and you can watch the studio. So, yeah, that was my time in New York, more or less. So how did the EF connection come about? I think they played Coney Island. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, I don't know. Well, maybe I, I don't know. Um, they played Coney Island. And then I lived across the street from Coney Island High hmm. and um, right above Dojo's. And I had some friends downstairs. And Larry from the Candy Snatchers was there. And... Larry was talking about it. It's like, fuck, you should be in that fucking band, Scotty. You need to play in that band. Rah, rah, rah. I don't know. I know that EF was doing like a cattle call for singers in Jersey. I can't remember where. But I remember taking the train out there, um, watching all these schmucks come in there. And I know I, f I fucked it up. I didn't know the lyrics or anything. You know what I mean? I fucked it up. But I had Larry and them had played me um, that first album, yeah. uh, that Electric Frankenstein, and it blew my fucking mind because at that time nobody sounded like that. They because they, it, I'm like, wow, this kind of reminds me of early Black Flag, and nobody's doing this right now. And because those first two albums are just, yeah, I mean, they're classic albums. So listening to that, that's why I, I wanted the gig. Did I get the gig? I got a phone call back saying, sorry, but we're going to go to greener pastures. I don't remember who, what, I never told him I was in another band or anything. I just came in there as just, you know, rope the all like the other schmucks, you know? Um, and then uh, <clears throat> I think I was talking to, it may have been Larry again or somebody I can't remember who. And they're like, fuck that. You got to tell them, dude, you were in verbal abuse, this and this and that. And you need to tell them that you need to be in that gang. So I called Sal. And I told Sal. I'm like, uh, I'm not going to take no for an answer. And then I rattled off all the shit that I had done. And Sal didn't even know that. And then he and I met at CBGB's and we talked. And, uh, and I, I, was up front as like, I, there's no way I'm going to sound like Steve. I'm not even going to try to sound like Steve. I can't. Um, and, uh, but I will turn your, your live shows from day to night. Mm. That I'll guarantee you. And with that, we shook hands and I started rehearsing with them. I think my first gig was a recording at WM, WMFU that live at WMF. Is that, is that the radio station? WMFU? FMU. FMU. Orange? FMU. Yeah. That's, that was the first gig, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I love that record. Yeah, that was my, and it was being recorded. I didn't know it was going to turn it, but you know, Sal. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's going to turn into an album. Yep. Uh, and then my, my, my gig, live gig in front of everybody was one of those horror conventions probably chill or theater in jersey yeah yeah and that's where i met uh miss tora santana mm. and uh and yeah she was a really nice lady really nice lady 
we come on, Tara. We grabbed her, put her in the car, <laughs> drove over to where DJ was playing. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Sat at the bar with her, made sure she was okay. Because, you know, she was an older lady, mm -hmm. but she was super nice and a lot of fun. Cool. Well, you, you just mentioned a bunch of stuff um, mm -hmm. I want to get into a little more because you mentioned Coney Allen High, D Gen, you know, uh, Candy Snatchers, CBGBs, of course, joining EF. When you came on board in EF, that was really the time I was diving into the New York scene as well because I'm from Jersey originally. Mm -hmm. It was such a cool thing happening at that time in the city. You had Coney Island High, you know, Jesse and Howie and like the Continental and, yeah. um, Trigger, yeah. you know, the wetlands mm -hmm. and sea. It was a fuck ton of stuff happening in the city and a ton of really good bands. Um, you know, you've been a part of a lot of scenes over the years. Um, what was your impression of New York at that time, you know, as, as far as the sort of groundswell that seemed to be happening then? I loved it. I loved that. I loved New York as much as I loved San Francisco, but in a different way, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, you're right. It was super healthy at the time. And for some strange reason, everybody wanted to play there. Candy Snatchers, Jackpot, Nashville Pussy. Everybody wanted to, you know what I mean? Come to New York. It's a con like you said, Continental was jumping. Coney Island High was jumping. Um, you know, the Toilet Boys, um, they had Don Hills going. Yep. Uh, I, yeah, you're right. It was super healthy. And a lot of really good, great bands, a lot that went under the radar, like you said, which should have gotten way more recognition, I think. Um, but it's, it was only really for people that had their finger on the on the pulse sort of thing, you know? Right. Uh, I loved it at the time. I thought it was perfect. And it, it was weird for me because it was kind of perfect timing when I got into EF at that time, too, um, yes. for the band as well. Yeah, exactly. That, that kind of led to something I wanted to talk to you about. Um, both of my stints in EF was when uh, Miller was singing. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and Miller's the man. I mean, I, I I love the guy. But things definitely changed when you joined the band. I won't say it was a better change, but I'll say it was a great change. Uh -huh. uh, the vibe of the band had changed with you fronting it. Uh, to my years, you know, I, I kind of knew that I kind of knew the brothers at that point, but it was a while before I actually started doing stuff with them. Um, but to me, it sounded it, it became like less rock, more punk, maybe. Um, and the sound was perfect for that time. When I heard six songs, I'm like, this is the perfect sound for this band at this point in time in this scene. Um, and that coincided really with EF kind of blowing up for for want of a better description i mean things were really kind of pumping for that band at that point i know that's when the touring started with ef i know the reception in california was very strong with the lineup you were a part of um you know what are some of the greatest memories you have as far as the reaction and and, and seeing the band kind of grow at that point in time um <clears throat> On on the East Coast, it was uh, you know New New York's a really 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 tough town for rock and roll. Period. Um, no matter that's why most bands. I mean, aside from Ramones, and you know that's why a lot of bands end up leaving there and going somewhere. You know, um, or there's a big gap in between. Super hard to to uh, break in there, but it just seemed like. Every you're right. Like everything was clicking on all cylinders right at that time. Um, I mean, the, there was amazing musicians in that. John Steele on drums. You know, you had Jim Foster, um, and then you had Dan and uh, and of course Sal. Uh, and I even played with another bass player, Chris, at the right. time. Uh, Chris was playing. I think that was the only band change was just Chris playing bass because Dan had to do something or he was burnt out or mad at Sal or something. I don't know. You know how the brothers are. <laughs> Dan will tell you. Uh, <clears throat> but it was really good. I was super surprised when we got out West. 
uh, and and saw the ground swell there because I didn't know because I'm far away. You know, it's just pre-internet and I don't think there was even cell phones. And if there was, I didn't have one. I think there were still pagers or something. But uh, so it, it was still word of mouth sort of thing. And then Flipside gave us the cover and that kind of that. And I think that was a little push from a a little person. His name may be Tony Iles, and I don't know. We <laughs> Who knows? But in any case, um, that helped out tremendously. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And, and I just I, I loved New York. I still do mm. miss it, you know, um, a whole heaps. But that that time in the band was uh, it was good, and but it also got dark for me as well. So I had my dark moments towards the end of it as well. But those were my moments. It had nothing to do with anybody else in the band, and that's what uh, kind of prompted me. I had to get out because I was getting eaten up. Mm. So, but yeah, so that, you. That was, you eventually, you know, I, I guess your time in the EF was about two and a half years, something like that. Three, so. two or three years, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. With a ton of stuff put out that because Sal, you know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're gonna put that out. Oh, okay. He just did that. Uh we we flew out to Sweden. Yeah, that was another trippy thing. They flew us all the way out to Sweden to do this festival. For like one night, we flew all the way to Sweden. We were getting attacked by like all this paparazzi. It was a trip. Um, none of us, we were all kind of, whoa. Um, came back and we played. Um, there's a place in New Jersey, New Brunswick. There's a club there. Or Tavern. Yeah, we played there. And Sal just released that, that live. And I'll tell you something, when I... That's when that when because I heard that and I usually cringe when I hear live stuff, but that one we wow. That it was a that was forceful. That was a good put out by by Sal there. Good call. Yeah, it was it was a good era of the band. You know, it really mm-hmm. was. Um, you know, both both full length records that you're on, uh mm-hmm. six songs and spare parts, you know, strong records. Strong record. Mm-hmm. I think, and I would put six songs up there next to how to make a monster as far as like the definitive EF records, you know, um, and especially this, the sound of six songs, just the way that record sounds, I think was a home run, you know, everything just, sort of, well, I'm going to say, and, <clears throat> and those guys can correct me, but I'm going to tell you that that has a lot to do with Jim Foster. Jim Foster, I, I don't know if did you play with Jim when you were no in the band? yeah. No. All I remember is being in the studio and and Jim really being very picky about how the sound, I think for all the early stuff, a lot of that had to do with with Jim. Real um, and of course it works. So nobody's, you know, nobody's gonna say anything. Um, and then John too. Because John's got a brilliant mind, you know, and uh, he helped out heaps on, especially on six songs. Because <clears throat> I lived in the city and he lived in the city at the time, too, whereas everybody else lived in New Jersey. So John and I would see each other more often. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, both of those guys are are just geniuses of what they do. Um, yeah. I had such a hard time when I when I joined ef i had such a hard time playing steel's shit he's such a great drummer i, I when he's i had him up, I'm like, how the fuck do you play action high i still can't figure it out you know <laughs> man he is he's uh, he's a drummer that is so in the pocket like all the time i don't i can't recall me being off tons of time john still being off i, I really can't recall john ever being off he mm. was a good backbone for any band, even yeah. the uh, when he was in the Sweethearts as well. You know, um, even Hole, or what was it, Hole Shot? Hole Shot, yeah. Is it Hole Shot? Yeah. But yeah, but but as far as the backbone went, he was a perfect backbone for for EF. 
and that's not a burn on any of the other drummers. That's just who I played with. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. he's he's like the measuring stick that we all have to try to meet, and we never fucking will. <laughs> ever. It sounds like you got a little frustrated. <laughs> no, I I have mad respect for him. I mean, I yeah. I did what I could with his stuff. I mean, I didn't become a drummer really until I had to mimic John Steele. Like, and I had done wow. bands, like bands that would like, you know, fill out CBs and stuff. But wow. it wasn't until I had to learn his stuff. I'm like, I'm an actual drummer now because I had to actually try to be like John Steele. Yeah. Just brilliant. And were you singing backups as well? No, 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 no. Thank God. Okay. So he was singing back. He was an integral part of the backups as well. Super integral, uh, both in the studio and live. Absolutely. And Jim, I mean, Jim's kind of like, he he's kind of like the, the, the stern teacher, yes. you Perfect. know, who really Perfect. knows Perfect. shit, you know, but it's always <laughs> kind of like, but um, smart guy. That's a perfect right? example. Perfect example. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave it at stern. <laughs> stern, yeah. But it worked. It worked for a couple of really yeah. great albums with all you yeah, guys absolutely. together. Um, so you end up going back to California. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but at some point shortly thereafter, you had some kind of involvement with Tang Records, the old the old boss. Yeah, I worked I worked with uh Curtis at his um his Melrose a record store that he had there. Right. And then uh he um and I did some um PR work for uh that band the business. He had just um put the business album out and he was still building up his catalog and stuff like that with Exploited and a bunch of other bands. Yeah. So um yeah so for about a year and a half uh I worked over there at Tang with Curtis. Cool. Yeah, I remember going to that store probably, well, it was early 2000s, so it was probably a little bit past your time at the place, the yeah. store on Melrose. Yeah, I think I was there 98, 99, something like that. Yeah. It all, it's yeah. all a little foggy for me there, too. <laughs> now, musically speaking, was Hollywood Hate the next band uh, that you got involved in? Yeah. Yeah, Hollywood Hate was the next one um, that started out with me, um, Pat Mack, uh, Bob from Blunt, uh, Susie Homewrecker. She was uh, Snap Her. I think she did the first Total Chaos album. Right. And she was playing with UXA at the time with Dee Dee. And, uh, and we had another fellow named Dave Marriott. And then we started switching guitar players until we did the actual recording. Hmm. Yeah, Suze is a great drummer. Great drummer. <laughs> she let me tell you something. We we would do live shows and, and Susie has this little voice, you know, do, do, do. and then she gets behind the kit, right? And she's got a little skirt on and everything. And then she starts playing. And I would I literally um who's what's the drummer's name from uh Bad Brains? Uh, Earl. Earl. Earl, we were playing with cro -Max. I think Earl was playing drums at the time. Oh, that would be Mackie. Mackie played in both bands. No, it wasn't Mackie, though. It was it was Earl from Bad Brains. They had come out as cro Um, I think it was it was John Bloodclot. I don't remember. Harley wasn't in the band. It was right when Harley had left. Uh-huh. Bloodclot was doing it. Anyways, I know it's all okay. So anyways, Earl's sitting there at the side of the stage. And his jaw just drops when he, he starts seeing Susie playing. And I, I watched a lot of drummers just go be in wow of her because she hit so damn hard for such a little thing. Mm. Um, oh, it was a lot of fun playing with Susie. You know, she was like our little sister too. So it was, it was fun. It was a good band. It was a lot of fun, that band. Out of curiosity, you mentioned Dee Dee. Um, any clue where she is these days? I, I I assume she's down in Los Angeles still. I know she found God and Jesus and, and all his buddies. Mm -hmm. Um so I, I 
I mean, she kind of faded away because she found all those buddies, you know, instead of the punk rock ones. Right. Um, so that's the last I've heard of her. I mean, I'm, and Susie found Jesus and his buddies too out in Arizona. And uh, <laughs> it's a trip. It's a trip. But um, yeah, I think she's just somewhere in in Los Angeles. I could be wrong too. She could be completely somewhere else. Mm. You know, living in a teepee in in New Mexico or something. I don't know. But <clears throat> but yeah, she found Jesus. I know that for sure. Well, you know, LA is kind of a funny place because you always have. Because I lived in LA for a few years. Mm-hmm. And what amazes me even still about the city is there are so many people from say even the seventies who are still playing. Like you can go out to LA tonight. I'm sure there's six people from the seventies and early eighties playing a gig somewhere. Yep. yep. You know? So you have like this ongoing, um, you know, forefathers and, and foremothers will say, you know, still out there doing it. Plus you have these newer bands coming up. When you were doing Hollywood Hate, um, you know, who were some of the the bands who were kind of coming up around the same time you would play with who were having, you know, their own sort of scene happening in the city at that time? Oh, um, I know we we played a lot with uh, like Texas Terry um, and Stitches. So there was. And. I mean, I'm trying to think because it was it's so long ago and so many different. The, the, at the time, the, the garage was happening in Silver Lake, so that that venue was jumping off. Um, I think more than anywhere else, it's LA is a trip. You know, it's like you said, there is all these people that play all this music and do all these bands and stuff, but there's not that many venues, not like how it used to be. Do you know what I mean? It used to be like you could go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and there's a gig every night. And now it's like Friday, Saturday, and that's kind of it. Even in in Los Angeles. Um. But I think, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, the Humpers. Uh, yeah. It was that that kind of era thing going on at the time. And kind of kind of moving things a little bit to more of the present time. I know you have um uh you're in a band now mm-hmm. uh, called the Infamous Stiffs. Mm-hmm. Um and if, if I'm not mistaken, that band kind of started within the last couple of years, right? It's a relatively new band. Do I have that right? Yeah, we're COVID baby. Okay. So we we did our first gig uh right before COVID. We did actually, I think we did two shows and then COVID hit. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and you know, I, I mean, that whole COVID thing and all that craziness, I mean, that went on with it was, uh, I don't know, it's crazy. So yeah, we started and uh, it's hard to like, I don't know about anybody else that was playing at a time if they just went ahead and locked themselves in their rooms or whatever, but like the four of us couldn't do that, or I should say the five of us couldn't do that. So we ended up recording like during the lockdown and ended up doing three videos during the the lockdown, you know, the touch the doorknob, you die era. Right. And uh, yeah. And then it ended up, I think we put the album out just right after it COVID had come down, not knowing what, the, what was going to happen to anybody or if anybody was even going to survive, right. you know? <clears throat> well, it's 2024 now. Um, things are mostly getting back, you know, um, it's still out there. I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. Um, but you know, the world of being in a band, going out and playing shows, and in some cases getting get, getting in a van and going on tour, that's all back, you know? Yeah. Um, how do you think, now that we're sort of turning the corner on this whole time, um, 
what are you seeing as the, the impact COVID had on, on just band life and, um, you know, whether it be the club scene or the opportunities for bands, you know, do you see, you know, when you compare say 2019 to what we are looking at five years later, what do you, what are you seeing and feeling out there? Like it never happened. Hmm. Like it never happened. Now it's business. I was, I would even go so much to say as, not even now, not even last year, but the year before that. Um, it started like coming back like a tsunami more than like trickles of waves. Um, I mean, we were playing punk rock bowling right after, you know, that. Um, and it was packed. Mm. Thousands of people there. And then the next year, last year, doing it again, you know, thousands of people there and stuff. So <clears throat> myself, I, 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 now it's as if it COVID never happened. Mm. It's a trip. How, how I mean, it did deplete the clubs itself, but I am starting to see some clubs starting to pop up here and there that are um, starting to continue to keep um, the music alive, which is a beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. live music is where, you know, it's the heartbeat. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I agree with you. I think I'm starting to see more and more of that as well out mm -hmm. here. Um, places I'd never heard of before the pandemic are now hosting shows and are, you know, new places. And so, you know, that it's one thing that, you know, can't be killed by a pandemic. You know, people want to go see music. People want to listen to records. You know, they want to be part of that culture. So it's as nice to see it bounce back the way it did. Um, yeah. I did want to revisit EF for a second because you had kind of a reunion experience with those guys not too long ago. Because mm -hmm. I know you sing on the new EF record as a guest singer, and he did a gig with them at a Alex's bar, right? About yeah. a year and a half ago or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh, <clears throat> they contacted me, Dan did, and and said we want you to do these four songs. They were coming out west. It, they were, it was gung ho. We didn't care where we were coming. We're coming out there, and we're going to record. We don't care. Rah rah rah. All right, all right. And I'm like, and I got to thinking to myself, you know, if they're going to come all the way out here and record, we should go somewhere and do a good recording, nice recording. So I got a hold of uh Tim Armstrong, and because uh, Tim just. You know, he's super welcoming, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And he didn't even hesitate. I didn't even know if he was going to be in town because they were here on specific dates. And uh, he said, yeah, come in. And he brought his engineer down himself. We went in there and, and cut all those tracks. Like literally, <clears throat> literally we're writing the lyrics and everything, uh, Johnny and I having coffee before we were headed down to the studio, you know, um, and just unleashed it completely live. And, and that's where that went. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, uh, then went and I did like the second half of, uh, the EF set. Um, I didn't want to be up there the whole time because they have a new singer, you know what I mean? And I'm not going to, I don't want to, I'll go up there and have fun with them and stuff, but it's his gig. You know what I mean? So, um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And, and, uh, and then Jamie was up there playing guitar with us as well and played guitar on the new EP as well. Yeah. Yeah. He's playing guitar on there as well. Yeah. So I, that I, was a lot of fun. I love that new record and, and I love hearing you on new EF man. you know? Yeah. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I got to give it to the, to uh, Johnny too. He did a great job. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and he's really pushing it and uh, really nice guy. Really nice guy. So was Steve. I mean, look, Steve Miller, when, when EF came back out to, I was working at Tang and uh real quick story. And EF was playing the, I think the Troubadour and they journeyed into Tang records and Steve saw me walk back what and we said hello to each other and he's all hey those guys got money for you and i'd never seen a fucking penny from ef you know what i mean 
And uh, he's all, meet us down at the Troubadour and Sal's going to write you a check. And went down this, I went down to the Troubadour and Sal wrote me a check. So, yeah. you know, can't knock that. No. That's a gigantic oh. pat on the back to Mr. Steve Miller there. Yeah. Yeah. Good people, man. You know, yeah. I, I had fun. I did a Canadian tour with, um, with Sal and Steve um, and a bass player named Drew. That was the lineup at the time. Uh -huh. And I'll just say this, and you'll know what I mean. We even have to get into it in a video, but you'll understand this. Uh -huh. I'll just say one thing. Conversations in the van with Sal. I'll just yeah. leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. I don't want to. Get... <clears throat> we'll definitely leave it at that. <laughs> so, I mean, we're looking at mid-April right now. There's a lot of year left. Um, how do things look for the rest of your 2024 as far as musical plans or otherwise? We are. We just got a new drummer, Mr. Uh, Dave Bach, who uh, he also um, plays in. Uh, with the Avengers and he's playing drums with us. He used to be in an old San Francisco band called the afflicted um, back in the day. Uh, he's playing drums and uh, bass player, um, Troy, who was in the boneless ones from the Berkeley Bay area. So we got a lot of Bay area people that live in LA transplants. So it's us four. And then of course, Mark um, playing uh, guitar still. And we're in the midst of writing. And I believe we're hoping we're hoping June, July, go in and record full length, probably 13 songs and uh, and get that cooking. Excellent. Comes out from there and just play gigs in between there. You know, <clears throat> do you see yourself coming out east anytime soon or in the future? You know, the whole the whole the whole touring thing. To be honest with you, this band, the infamous infamous stiffs. We've done everything DIY still, everything paid for the recording, paid for the pressing all because of COVID and all that. And it was a bitch to get things pressed. And we had to, we had to scramble during COVID to get it pressed. Um, and we, we still do even booking shows DIY, which is really hard to do because you're up against everybody has a booking agent. Do you know what I mean? And they're going to book, obviously, their catalog and their acts. You know? Um, so we just take what we can. We get hollered out all the time and to play shows and so on and so forth. I would love to go back east with this band. Um, I think it would go over really well. Um, I'd love to go back to Europe with this band. We have people at our shows now from Germany and Denmark and all these other places you must come to the Europe and make big party and so forth. And so I think it would, I think it would be good. Um, and you'll see when we put out the new, the new music as well. And then after this, I'll give you links so everybody can check out the videos that we did and so on and so forth. Yeah. Excellent. I'll put all that stuff up in the video description. So, I mean, I would definitely encourage anyone watching the video to check out um scott's new stuff with the infamous stiffs if you're um, unfamiliar with his era in ef listen to that material as well that's some of the finest punk rock and roll of the 90s um and of course you know go back to verbal ab abuse and condemn to death i mean that stuff yeah. is classic as well so there's a lot of cool stuff for people to check out and get into um but and I'll hollywood hate that. you got to check that out too that lp which one Hollywood hate LP that we put out. Yes. And I know it's just like, fuck Scott, how many bands? <clears throat> yeah. Well, Hey man, you know, it's, I, I love the fact that you're still out doing it, which, which kind of leads me to my last question. You know, I guess we're looking at 40 plus years. You've been in the game doing this. First of all, your voice is, has hung in there. Fantastic, man. You still sound great. Um, what what keeps you engaged in this 
know, because obviously it's not just a hobby you do until you're out of school at this point. This is pretty much who you are. Um, what keeps you in the game and active in music all, after all these years? Well, I think you answered it when you said that's who you are. That's kind of who I am. And and <clears throat> in all honesty, like even even in between each of those bands, there'll be like maybe a year, maybe even two years sometime. But you get that itch. Um that you just want to play, you know what I mean? It's not so much getting the accolades and so forth of playing live because real at this point I could care less, you know, it's the matter of making music and, and sh being able to share with a bunch of people because you kind of want to leave the earth, hopefully a little bit better for others. And if that means I can do that in music, that's how, kind of, that's how I would like to do it then. You know what I mean? Cause I, I can't change the world politically or any of that other shit but i can musically you know somewhat even if it's a niche <clears throat> and then you know and it's all it's i mean honestly it's 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 all i fucking know man really <laughs> and it's fun you know yeah. I mean? who doesn't like getting together with some buddies and making some noise man and then hey recording it you know what i mean and then going playing with buddies you know and it's you know that's fun it's fun. Fuck it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, listen, man, I've enjoyed your work for a long time. Um, I've wanted to have a conversation like this with you for, for years. I'm glad we finally connected. Um, it's always a pleasure talking to someone else from the EF family and history, you know, get their perspective on things and uh, really psyched for the new record coming out later this year and uh you know all the best to you congratulations on your past work and i know your best work is still to come so i really appreciate you coming on man yeah thanks so much joel thanks for having me appreciate it my pleasure man we'll do it again soon okay buddy take care you too